So hello everyone again. Um, so we've got uh, Rosalind Davis and Justin Hibbs with us now. Um, so they're both going to be sharing um, their thoughts on kind of creative strategies. Um, last year, uh, Rosalind and Justin both ran um, a summer school with us online called Thriving Surviving as an Artist. Uh, one of the participants of that was Lisa Cole, who's going to be joining us after this talk. Um, and um, after the success of the, the course last year, we're looking at doing it again this spring. So um, during uh, their talk today, they'll be talking a bit about what's kind of going to be involved uh, in the course. So um, I'll pass over to you both. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. <laughs> and hello, everyone. We're just going to share our screen. And thank you for joining us today. I hope uh, you've been having a great day so far. Um, so hopefully you can all see this. I'm sure you can. Uh, but um, yes, we, we did a, a great course uh, last year. It was going to be a physical course, but it became an online course. And it was fantastic because lots of people could join that couldn't ordinarily have traveled there and so on. But um, we got amazing feedback and there's been loads of wonderful things that have come out of it. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end. Um, but I'm Rosalind, I'm an artist, curator, writer, mentor, teacher and consultant. Um, as an artist, I uh, work across disciplines, painting, installation um, and exhibited internationally and have works in private and public collections. Um, and I will tell you a little bit more about some of the other things I do along the way, um, but kind of teach across the country, give lectures kind of along the lines of these to various different, you know, universities, arts organisations, all sorts, really. Um, and we've been collaborating as well uh, on installations over the last three years. Yeah, so I'm Justin Hibbs. Um, I'm a visual artist as well. Um, I've also been for many years a teacher, but um, more recently I've been working as a designer, which is something we'll talk a little bit about uh, in this um, talk about you know, kind of idea of um, working in different contexts and um, utilising different opportunities. Um, but I also have an independent practice I've shown internationally. I work with a gallery in Mexico City and I collaborate with Rosalind here in London. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, we'll um, carry on and sort of talk about, I suppose the talk will cover some of the content that you might expect in the talks that we do in the course. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll also talk a little bit, as Ross said at the end, about what's involved in that. So often as artists, like this idea as artists, as entrepreneurs, is like thinking about the opportunities that you might get or might want to create. Um, and as an artist or a creative, whatever you're in, you're kind of constantly needing to get opportunities to keep continue to further your career, your work, to evolve your ideas, to get new business, new audiences, new collectors, whatever it may be. And a huge amount of that is about the research factor, you know, where are the opportunities, but also where might there be an opportunity is really important because there's obviously lots of things that are listed as opportunities, but sometimes you have to think outside the box and think laterally about, what it is that you want to get out of an opportunity and it might not be in a kind of very clear-cut art space fair art fair whatever it may be it might be something that's that's kind of left field really um you need to do lots of networking uh, obviously right now it's all online but actually that has to be a really big proactive chunk of what you are doing um, so that when you are when you do get an opportunity you know you're making sure that you're publicizing it that you're making making connections as much as you can throughout building relationships and word of mouth is huge um, you kind of under, as the art world or you know the and when I say art, oh, I'm talking about across all mediums seems massive when you kind of start to navigate it a bit you realize that quite a lot of people know other people um, li literally my neighbors know my former tutor from Royal College of Art um, and uh, I didn't know that and uh but yeah and, and then the kind of words of mouth of people recommending you for opportunities and you know at, but you have to when you get an opportunity not just let it pass through your fingers and and kind of just think oh well i've done that now um it's like making those relationships really work promotion is really important um and again we will be talking there's a whole chunk on the course about this um in terms of 
representing yourself and promotion not in a sort of negative way and I know it's a funny word but it's about the idea of standing behind your work being ready for an opportunity and and like having things out there you know in the world so that you're kind of constantly talking about the stuff that you're doing to do with your artwork um seizing those opportunities whether somebody says would you like to have an exhibition on a shelf or in a drawer <laughs> um they're making that the best drawer exhibition ever and not just kind of you know uh coming at it with a sort of well it's you know it's not the sort of quite what I was looking for in my career but you know I'll do it anyway but actually going no I'm going to maximize this I'm going to make this amazing and also there are in every person's career there's dips and sometimes there aren't opportunities or you don't like the opportunities that are out there exactly so then you create your own ones you think well what do I want to do you know what would I like to get out of an opportunity and I'm going to talk a bit about people creating opportunities for other artists and by which they're also then building their relationships, their network, their promotion as well. Being organised and professional counts for a lot. Uh, there is no reason to uh, to kind of uh, fit the stereotype of a disorganised artist. Um, being present and memorable, by which I mean, you know, when you go to go to an art, when we can go to artist talks or where we are now, but like speaking up, asking a good question, um, but also if you are given an opportunity. You know, going the extra mile, just being like the, the person that's like, mm, do you, you know, going back to the exhibition or going back to the event or whatever it is that you're doing, not just on the once, but kind of going back and proactively bringing people to see your work at whatever opportunity you've got. Being kind and polite sounds obvious, but um, sometimes that can be a little bit of a um, neglected attitude in, in some parts of the art world. Um, and it really does count for a lot. You know, it's again being memorable in all the right ways rather than sort of having uh, sort of loaded expectations maybe about what you think other people should do for you and thinking about, well, we're all humans um, at the end of the day. And representing yourself in all the best possible ways, you know, this is about being professional and the sort of exterior of what you do, you know, and and making sure that you are kind of building confidence towards yourself and your work. And I know that takes time and, and we can help with that along the way. Um, but there's loads of opportunities around, but also just research them, who's involved, what's, you know, what's involved for you, you know, how much work is it gonna take? Um, have you got something at the ready? It may be that also an opportunity can inspire you. You think, well, it's not quite what I do yet, but that sounds really intriguing and I might go and do something with that. And there's hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of arts organisation and gallery models. Um, and although you'll know this maybe subconsciously, it's kind of good to break down again when you're looking at opportunities, who you're going to work with, what are the people like behind all of these different kinds of spaces. Um, you know, often people just think about exhibiting in just commercial galleries. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot more kind of layered things that are going on in terms of where people are showing their work in whatever context that work is. And um, Interestingly enough, some commercial galleries, as they're kind of called, um, you know, don't have the intention to sell work, which is, uh, this is Justin Hibbs at Carol Fletcher Gallery, whose intention was to actually just help the artists evolve rather than sell their work. So they had a very different um, kind of motivation, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, that is an interesting one because Carol Fletcher is no longer around, but they were probably one of the biggest galleries that I'd worked with in central London, and they had this epic fantastic space but they were building a program so in a way they they hadn't got this huge kind of list of they did start to sell works to really important museums after about five years and stuff but in the first place when I had my show it was much more about um, just exposure and building the right profile for the gallery so I was seeing them kind of build their profile and their network of followers and and they built a really really loyal following but it, it was interesting because I had a show with a budget, but it, it wasn't really about selling work. And it, it it was an amazing opportunity, and I don't think I sold anything. Uh, I <laughs> no. sold a small drawing about a year later or something. But, you know, it, it at the same time, I developed, you know, it was such a great development opportunity. So um, I think that notion that when you get with a commercial gallery that there will be some sort of commerce <laughs> uh, <laughs> can be a bit of a myth as well. Yeah. And we worked with all these different kinds of spaces across our careers in many different ways. Justin's shown at art fairs across the world. I 
shown in ones in the UK. Um, but yeah, all of these different opportunities. And again, all the different people that work in those different institutions and museums and, and you know, it's a real education. But it is about people being creative about space. You know, you need to research, you know, galleries, whatever it is, a craft gallery, a textiles gallery, whatever it is that you're interested in doing. But artist-led spaces, artist curators who are putting on their own shows, just like I've done for many years, and pop-ups. So again, uh, on this image here is um, Justin did an installation in, in a lift, a working lift in a housing estate. And again, taking that opportunity, not just like, oh, I'll just put something on the wall. Um, it was like a, an interactive experience, really, and also really difficult to install. Um, and that was curated by an artist that we know called Jaime Gilly. And so a lot of artists are curators because they want to, you know, they want to direct their own kind of careers in a way and it happens across many different fields if you think about in film and tv lots of actors who become writers who become directors so that they can create the projects that they want to make and not just wait to be cast in a role you know if you gosh fleabag that's a classic example um but you've got to think about you know the type of art world that you might want to be part of as well um that's really important because there are many kinds um around and you might have as we do many sort of we're kind of in different art worlds all the time and some of them are sort of you know artist led and some are more gallery led and so on but um the image on the right is a space that i used to um that i curated slash directed and managed uh, called core gallery and so this idea of this talk of artists as an entrepreneur i saw a wide corridor an underused space um and a slightly kind of you know it was a studio artist in this space having endless exhibitions of their work. And I realized that's not gonna work because you kind of max out your audience, there's nothing new to see. But if we injected some more people, we needed to get more people through the door and it, it get more exposure, build a profile. So we t I turned it into a gallery space and invited artists, curators in that wanted to kind of try out ideas, did a huge amount of stuff. Um, in 17 exhibitions, five open studios, 22 workshops and talks, as you can see here. But also started an education program for artists of all the things that I wished I'd learned to art school and hadn't. Um, and that was amazing. But it, for me as well, I'd been slightly in the wilderness. So after leaving the RCA, I had some network, but I didn't really know how to kind of get beyond. And I'd go to events a bit and social media wasn't as much in those days, but um, it was really, um, integral and out of that came jobs became exhibition opportunities as I got to know other artist curators or curators which suggest me for other projects so it was kind of a you know it was unpaid it was just you know it was a lot of work and I was also exhibiting work and juggling jobs and all the rest of the things that we do um but it was hugely enlightening educational and it built me um it built me start helped me to start to build more of a career I suppose in the arts and it went on, I, I started DIY Educate with Annabelle Tilly, lost our building <laughs> and found another one uh, with the ASC Studios. And they gave us a gallery space, which was really amazing to have that kind of add on and not having to pay for it, which is obviously a huge thing. So it's also trying to find those opportunities where you don't have to find rent is <laughs> um, also really good. Obviously we paid for our studio, but um, that was a kind of massive bonus that we had a space we could use. Again, it wasn't glamorous. It was, you know, uh, in New Cross and it was a bit of a bunker, but it's about what you build and the fact that you build an art world and people come, you know, um, and again, similar program curating a lot more um, open calls, exhibitions, membership program. And then we had some funding and we kind of raised funds as well. But again, it, after being in the art world, it was very much about what how we wanted to reinvent it. You know, there'd been, you know, I'd been out of art school and I'd been, been out of art school for, for a few years. And we were like, what did we like about these experiences and what didn't we like? And it would be simple things, you know, it'd be like name tags, you know, so that you actually got to know people. Because as an artist myself, I never got to meet other artists I was exhibiting with, the curators I was working with and so on. But, you know, it's just still, it could just be a wide corridor you know, a window box or whatever it may be, but you can create an art world around it. And that's really important um, as we all kind of need those things. And, you know, building the profile promotion uh, led to being commissioned to write a book, which I'd never expected to have done. But these things didn't come out of the blue. Like we were building the profile of Zap and um, this came out of 
some very concentrated promotion via a social media debate, um, which was an accident in the first place anyway. But I'd been building my Twitter profile and everything by kind of conversations and getting to know the art world. Um, and this book was sort of the reason why the publishers found us is because when you're doing a Google search and so on, they're like, who's artists and educators and writers? And I'd been writing, you know, blogs for artist newsletter and slash AN um, and reports and so on. So I had some of that behind, you know, in my in my back pocket, so to speak. And um, it was actually, you know, through this social media conversation that I had, which you never know what's going to happen about what, you know, how do you survive as an artist? And it went kind of crazy, sort of viral on Twitter at the time with hundreds of artists telling us how they did survive as artists or tried to survive as artists. And that all helps with the sort of conversation, but also suddenly we were networked into loads of arts organizations too, that we hadn't cut, you know, kind of built relationships at that point and universities that were like, that, that was really amazing. And there was an article about it and artist newsletter as well. Um, yeah. And so we were commissioned to do this, but again, it's sort of, you're having to, uh, change gears and suddenly learn how to write a book which doesn't come naturally um, but it was fantastic and it, it's out there in the world all around the world um, now as well which is fantastic and lots of people contributed including Justin and many other artists so you know again it wasn't just kind of being in my little kind of hidey hole and hoping somebody was going to ask me to write a book it was getting out there being really present and so on um, which leads us nicely to curating as well, which is a huge part of my practice. Um, but having been out of art school, been in group exhibitions, as I say, wanting to create a show that I wanted to be in that I'd chosen all the artists. And it really came from, from that perspective. And this was the one that Annabelle and I did together at Transition Gallery in a separate space to Zap, where we had our gallery. Uh, that was kind of important to work with new people, new organizations, new audiences, and so on. And all the people we chose to be in that, we knew that would be in the same mindset, the same program of, you know, we pitched in, we, you know, it wasn't funded, we kind of self-funded it. Like, for example, we got an exhibition postcard, this wonderful design by Anna Roop. Um, we, you know, paid for a bar, we all took turns invigilating. And actually that's a really good thing is invigilating because you actually get to meet the people that come and see your show, you know? Um, and I think making sure that you are at your exhibitions or whatever it is that you're doing to show your work, that you're there as much as possible in a present way. Um, so that was a really exciting thing and it, it kind of was building my experience as well of working sites specifically, working with artist sites specifically. Um, and went on from when Zap was closing um, and uh, we were moving on in different directions, <laughs> was the curator at Collie Resto Gallery, which sadly closed its premises in the 2020, uh, but there are new horizons, but the actual physical gallery that we had, it's a gallery and a law firm, um, to just kind of give you, again, it's not a white cube space, it was a living, breathing, working space, which was really a fun way to work site specifically, um, and did 11 shows there across three, th sorry, four years, but a um, huge amount of artists that I worked with. And that was also um, the point of that as well, is that, you know, I got this job as a curator, I was a freelance, um, but the shows were sort of on for four months and I would take tours of artists around. I could have just been like, here's your show. Um, I was really present. I was inviting people in. I had like VIPs. I had collectors, like I built a whole collector base there because I was like, this is a great opportunity. And I finally got a space. I don't have to pay any rent either. And um and really made the most of it and, and not just kind of sitting on my heels and being like, well, I've, I've got the job now. It's like kind of really work at building audiences and loyalty. And um, it led to lots of wonderful things in that period of time as well. And again, opportunities, it goes both ways of when you create a network um, that other people come back and, and kind of invite you to do other things because they like working with you, they like the experience and so on. And finally got to pay artists as well, which. Mm -hmm hadn't done a lot of been able to do very much of before is a very grassroots initiative but yeah and remembering the artists are kind of going a bit circular to that how do you get opportunities but the artists that were memorable and present I would remember them to put in shows that kept in touch 
you know, there's a lot of artists that I've worked with even across these these shows. I've never heard from again after I've shown them, never seen them again. They don't, they only come for the, their show. Um, whereas others, you kind of actually becomes a relationship. They, you know, become familiar with them, their practices. And also mm -hmm. lots of things come to you when you have that curator hat on where another curator will say, do you know anyone that works within this medium or this theme? And you go, oh yes, I do. I know several people. So it's it's never just the one thing. You never know where people are going to go as well, where they go on to, um, which is really interesting. Um, but that is um, a little bit of me. Um, and just saying about portfolio careers is, is very true. Mm -hmm. All artists are part-time artists in their way. Um, and these are opportunities that come, you know, it's kind of making sure that you are really engaged and committed going the extra mile. Um, I do a lot of teaching in different realms. I've done lots of different things and I just kind of go, yeah, this is a creative act. This looks fun. And, and um, let me see how I can decide to create an artwork that's about collaboration for, you know, a thousand school kids across a day in the South Bank Centre or whatever it is, you know, thanking people, being memorable uh, and not just being like, oh, OK. Um, hmm. uh, and there's loads of ways that you can be creative um, in, a, in a sort of thinking about how to earn money away, mm. um, which moves us on to Justin. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to just talk a little bit about, um, you know, working as a uh, fine artist and you know Ros has just been talking about portfolio careers so for years I, I taught in art schools I ended up um, being a course director for a foundation course so these you know it's you know, pretty much all artists or craftspeople designers there uh, or freelance designers there you know they probably have another job and so that sort of juggle is really normal and you know um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some opportunities that came up for me recently, which has, uh, has kind of meant, you know, working in a different context and starting to think about working as an artist, but trying not to, or just not being um, stuck in the fine art area. Because I think for many years, I just thought it was all about getting a good enough gallery that would sell enough work that <laughs> I could make a living full time as an artist, which is very, very rare. So, um, I I had done a few commissions and um, in the kind of circular way that Rosalind was talking about, you know, if you put yourself out there and it creates opportunities through one of Rosalind's exhibitions at Collier Bristow, I happened to meet um, uh, a couple that collected art but run a restaurant group and um, a small chain of restaurants in London. And um, we got talking and, and I was asked to do a, a, a kind of art commission, like an installation in a small room in Soho, um, like a mirror installation. So this was the start of something. And I've done a few commissions before, um, some in the private kind of, you know, for private clients. Um, and it's a really nice way to work because um, it's kind of about working in partnership, working with somebody else. To, you know, in this situation, I was being asked to, um, create a really special kind of Soho sort of atmosphere in this room. Um, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that and moving into um, commission. So I got this commission for the Daisy Green Collection and um, it's not, a, you know, it's not a gallery, but they were very open in that they asked me to make, you know, something like my work that I make in installations, but basically to create a small room. And um, it was a really interesting opportunity because it was much bigger probably as an installation than I've done in any other space. Um, and I had to really think about how that room would feel and be used. It was like a different challenge to if you're just in a gallery and what piece do I want to make? So there were some real challenges around, you know, the kind of idea of, you know, the amount of creative freedom that I had there to do something, but then, kind of, you know, how do I hone this down? Mm. So I began immediately to work with dye bond, a material that I've used a lot before. It was, you know, technically complex. It was kind of a big jigsaw puzzle of parts, mirror parts. Um, and there were some interesting problems that came up there. So pricing it, for instance, I thought about it in, in the kind of way I might do like a piece on a gallery wall and sort of priced it at a similar price, which was way under <laughs> what I should have probably charged the piece um 
uh, started with just the two wheel. That's a maquette for it, you can see in the picture there. Some of the pros for it was they were really nice clients and they were outside of the art world. So they were thinking differently. They weren't just collecting a piece, but they were wanting to work with me collaboratively to make, you know, a really amazing small environment. Um, there was, it was kind of a really ambitious kind of um, piece in terms of learning about new processes, which was really cool for me, you know, like thinking about, all right, I can apply this to my art practice. Um, you know, and working for restaurants, there was always nice meetings with free coffee. And, <laughs> <laughs> and meals. <laughs> and meals. Um, but this was one of the, so this was the first piece I did for them. And basically I made these huge panels that went together as a jigsaw. But actually this was really, really great because, you know, I had to learn how to make this myself in panels. And it's really fed through to my practice in that, in terms of understanding how I could scale up my work. And also different processes. Um, you know, I had to teach myself Illustrator so that the files could be cut on a CNC machine, which has been very useful moving forward. Um, and this was the final thing installed. And it took so much longer than I was expecting. So, you know, there were various things about the planning at the start. I was thinking this would be done in three months. And mm. <laughs> I think at the first phase of this project it took six months um just to get to the sort of finished design and then we installed it quite quickly so it's probably six to eight months before it was installed um then um they really liked it um and actually the project expanded a bit so i did this kind of wall that came around the corner that you can see there and it was quite interesting because uh in a way there was a lot of conversation then about how this project could develop and expand and i think that was quite a nice aspect of it that you know there's still we're still going to go back to this project and put some mirrors upstairs so it became a kind of evolving conversation and story really but from this through this long period of this installation um other opportunities started to emerge so um i was asked to you know could i just put some mirrors behind the picture on the left is just some mirrors that were put behind the sort of coffee area um and then from that, I, I put some mirrors in a stairwell in a different restaurant. And then I kind of began to realize, well, actually, I have all these skills. And it's quite, it's really interesting to apply them to, you know, what would normally be a design context, but I'm very much doing it as an artist. Um, and so slowly they began to ask me to do more and more small jobs. And I began to realize that this is a really, really interesting area to work, you know, like outside of the fine art area. Some of it's like my work, like the installation I did for Scarlet Green is really an installation like I might show in a gallery. But these things are more like, almost like a a line of my work, which you might, you know, it's much more uh, functional in a way. And, um, you know, so this piece, they asked me, this is for a restaurant called Ziggy Green, and they wanted to make a huge David Bowie inspired lightning bolt um, and this building has an association with, um, it's one Hedden Street, and it has an association with um, David Bowie. One of his record covers was shot there. And so, you know, this is not the kind of thing that I would make normally, but it was an amazing process. You know, I had to work out how do I make this piece that would fold over and just hang on this Corian balcony. But also the process was very interesting. I ended up, you know, creating this Illustrator file that was printed on the reverse of Perspex, which I've now gone on to use again. And so, slowly I was kind of developing uh, a role here as a designer and it was really really um, great for me because it was kind of I mean my work does operate on the sort of fault line in a way between art and design practice um, but I started to realize that as an artist actually you have quite a lot to offer in other contexts and that's something that maybe we don't um, we don't realize, but you know, just your kind of creativity and kind of critical thinking skills, you know, so I, I'm always thinking, how can we make a great experience? So this is the first bar I designed, but it was like the lower part of that bar might be something that I'd exhibit on a gallery wall. And it's a bit like, oh, how can you apply that to a bar and make a great experience? Um, and so I think, you know, we, we often, can get trapped in our area like oh i'm a ceramicist i should just show in like you know craft type galleries and actually you might have there might be a much more interesting place in which you can work mm. um because well, there are limited opportunities as well in the sort of mm. 
the whole world, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and, and all, actually a lot of the way that I work does require a certain level of production. So it was always a question of using exhibitions as an opportunity to produce new work, but I always had to fund it. Whereas here I'm making things and learning yeah. about production processes and they're being funded, you yeah. know, and they're being made. And it's... it's um, And you're being paid. <laughs> and I'm being paid. So what happened is slowly, I mean, my teaching job as a course director was so overwhelming and becoming so sort of politicised that actually I kind of made a leap and, and started to work um, full time on a sort of month by month basis for the restaurant and suddenly found myself working. Um, you know, and I was very lucky because this happened just before the whole COVID thing and the first lockdown. And actually they just kept me on because they were designing a new restaurant space. And I, I was beginning to design much more conceptual stuff like this kind of layout of pass areas and, you know, they were giving me problems like how do we cover all these vents up here? And so as the kind of um, lockdown kicked in, I found myself carrying on working. Um, this was a set of social distancing screens that I did for the restaurants when we reopened in the sort of spring summer of last year in June. And this was an amazing project for me because um, I'd made all these artworks based on screens. And then they came to me with the problem of we're going to reopen, but we need a really, really um, a different approach to this idea of social distancing screens. And we don't want it to be like a kind of a really clinical thing that you'd find in a chemist or, so, you know, we set about this idea of like, okay, so we need, they need to be affordable. So we kind of made a plywood system. I designed the plywood systems. They're all CNC cut from plywood. We have this kind of really nice sustainable acrylic, which is all recycled. And then we basically set about making these as artwork so people would want to sit around them. And for me, this is a great example of how as artists we can be kind of quite entrepreneurial and it's like thinking, actually, you know, there's this real problem out there right now. And actually maybe I can make, maybe I can find a solution to a problem here that's really um, attractive and not like everything else that you've seen. So this is a project that I'm really proud of. And actually I'm making a second edition now as we come out of the next lockdown. So. This is the kind of thing that um, I find quite inspiring where it's a real, you know, I, I would show these in the gallery, but they, they have a real function. Um, this was the very last project that I've really, the big project that I did for the restaurants through most of last year. And this was for a huge new restaurant opening in Paddington. And you can see, you know, inspired, I designed the pass area below and the, series of photographs above were me taking photographs in our flat here of all the plants that we have. So it's kind of work that's come out of a lockdown and they they wanted me to design something. At first they just thought it would be dive bomb panels that would cover all the kind of vents and um, air ventilation above the kitchen. But actually it was like thinking, well, how can we make that really something different and something you know so I was thinking about this kind of almost like an indoor greenhouse um, terraria kind of um, set up and I'd wanted for years to work with these kind of metal frames that are inspired by window grills that I'd seen in Mexico City when I'd shown there so in a way this was a chance to you know have these metal frames made and develop that and these huge photographs that were printed on the back of acrylic that were inspired by the lightning bolt and so suddenly I find myself making work that's really new for me, really exciting and, um, you know, very much out of my context. But if you think, if I made this work for a gallery and I, I, I would like to develop this project with the metal frames for a project in Mexico and go and do that with traditional window grill makers. But in a the gallery, these works might only be seen for, you know, somebody walks into a gallery, 10 minutes later, they walk back out. And people sit if here. You're lucky, for, that's quite long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I, I realise it's a really good context for making artworks. You know, people sit here and have lunch for two hours and look at that. So it's yeah, like, and also they have of, things like they have a really strong social media, so that you're kind of getting again another audience. And there's opportunities that come out of that, out of the connections that they have. Mm. You know, the, their kind of relationships and and that will garner other work or commissions or whatever it may be. Um, but it was kind of seizing the opportunity, and when you met. Pru and Tom that run this restaurant it was again through a network being at a private view going on for a meal at 
and Justin showing his work, you know, on his mm. phone, not being like, oh yeah, I just sort of make stuff. It was like, you know, being standing behind the work and 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 kind of you never know who you're going to meet over a dinner mm. or a you know open studio and and being ready to be stepping up and being like, yeah, this is my work. This is what I do. Um, rather than sort of fumbling around, you know, as we we can all do, but you know, it's sort of being ready at all times when you're sort of publicly out there um, in that way. Yeah, I mean, as a result of doing these works, it's meant that, you know, I spend most of my time designing, you know, sometimes artworks like this, but sometimes, you know, I've just spent some time designing some tabletops, but actually it's really amazing to think, oh yeah, I make some enamel tabletops that look like my work, but it's actually now on the table. Mm. And so I kind of very much approach it as an artist. And I think where I've been lucky is I think these people have appreciated ah, it's actually really interesting to have an artist design mm. stuff because they're coming with a very different set of skills. And also different and ways of approaching ideas and problem solving. So it's, mm. it's a really one of those uh, unknown opportunities. And I now also work for... Um, Daisy Green collection. Um, when uh, my gallery closed, um, they had this huge site. It's massive. If you you can come and see the canal, uh, where I planted an indoor and outdoor garden, and it was sort of we have a, you know, we have a we don't really have a garden. We have a little balcony, but we have an indoor jungle, and um, they'd seen a bit of that, and they were like, "Do you want to do this project?" And I was sort of like, "Oh my god," <laughs> you know. Um, out out of my comfort zone but I think that's also really important and I see this as an extension of my practice as a painter you know it's about texture and line and pattern and form and scale um and layering and so I don't see it as this is my other job but it's kind of it all just feeds into each other and it's sort of you know I could have just been like I don't know if I can do it but I was sort of you learn and you realize that you can you can do all sorts of things as artists you know that that kind of you know where you can get a you know a paid job but you know, you can also be really creative in it um and so that's been exciting and leads to other things too um so just to kind of quickly run through this i've realized we're running out of time but um there is a pre-record that i've done for clay hill um about creative strategies uh, more so i mean this is a briefer this is a kind of overview of that slightly longer talk and also in that I talk about my own work this was a kind of project that a drawing project called Catalyst it was a group drawing project where we literally would pass an artwork between us and respond to it make another one out of it um, and it wasn't intended for anything other than just fun and like a game mm. um, with these artists here um, and then we went on to do another Catalyst introduce another artist expand the expand the opportunity to other people, um, expand and bring in new ideas, which is Mary Michelle and this next one. And then we were approached to show these because we were sharing it online, we were talking about it, we were telling people about this drawing project. And so people were like, this sounds really interesting. And, you know, sometimes things come along that way, but we didn't just, again, it was like, we were promoting it on social media in a sort of playful way. Um, hopefully you'll all know about this correspondence collective also um taking mm. that opportunity creating that opportunity for other people so clay hill has letterpress so correspondence collective was set up by amanda lynch that was speaking before um, she, she was on our course and um everyone started to think really imaginatively about what they what they had at their disposal where you could bring in other artists you know and uh, another way that we did this was with um, a project called Share and Exchange, just, just kind of giving you ideas as well. This can be a purely online thing as well, is that we would have, uh, everyone would, all of our members of Zap um, would come bring an artwork, bring a bottle of wine and buy a raffle ticket and win another artist's work. And suddenly you've got, you know, a, two new people that you might not have known. Um, and, you know, out of that, two artists were introduced to one another they became great friends shared studios did collaborations and kind of it's very simple it was a one night thing you know when we get back out of this then maybe you know you can do <laughs> do it in a physical space but you know th there's just so many ways that by doing these projects you're kind of building an art world which we all need and building a new network and kind of finding like-minded you know people 
the Object Dresser Gallery. This is by another one of our students from the online course, Sally Eldars. Um, she had an old chest and she's been doing exhibitions and you know, it's a fantastic learning curve and a way to sort of celebrate other artists. And then, you know, along the way, it helps you. You've got this other project you can talk about and not feel it's just like, oh, I'm an artist, please see me. You can kind of be the one that's driving the ship, you know, and there's, the Tiny Cat Gallery, which is the talk after ours. Another one of our students, Lisa, who came last year. And all of these people were like, actually, yeah, I'm gonna create an opportunity for other artists. And through which doing that, it builds their confidence and builds their, you know, sort of reputation. And, you know, it's led to great things for Lisa. And we're sort of super proud to see our, our babies go off mm. and do these amazing projects. And, you know, there's other people I've mentored that set up a supermarket sculpture park and, uh, another lady that did um, exhibitions and kind of window displays and it's sort of it's a lot of fun basically um, you know and do it in a man manageable way you might not want to do an exhibition every month but every so often make it an event and it will really empower you um, you know you can be entrepreneurial about it you can try and get funding for it and you might look for getting again not just funding in the traditional sense but you might you know um, get funding from an estate agent or something like that you know where are you going to exhibit your work and when we come out of lockdown <laughs> this is something I was talking about the other day with someone where it's like where's everyone going to be the hairdressers how about having an exhibition in the hairdressers you know and it's not going to be you know this kind of ready wrapped beautiful present of a space it's going to be like work with people you know who do you want to see your work and yeah of course one wants to sell their work, usually, you know, in some way, shame, shape or form. But, you, you know, it, it, it's throwing up all these interesting ideas because now, now more than ever, the art world is, there's a lot less opportunity um, during lockdown, a lot of spaces have closed, you know, so where are we going to show our work? How are we going to get out there? And who knows? And like waiting for that perfect opportunity around the corner that might, or might not exist. Um, I think the current the current yeah. situation as well is going to throw up a lot of new opportunities for us to be more creative. You know, like empty shops. Um, can you take over an empty shop for a month, and you know, maybe a landlord will think that. Well, that's great. That would just get some people some traffic. But yeah. you know, it's that kind of. You know, there's people doing um, you know music stuff in you know empty shops and so on. So just like, what can we do? Um, there's been loads of online stuff. I'm going to just quickly go through this, but you know, and making an online art exhibition, but doing it in a really in innovative way, having projects, you know, choosing five artists or five paintings once a week, again, will connect you to the other five, you know, five artists that you've chosen. Like you can do really simple things on Instagram and other people I've known have sort of set up podcasts or interviews or, you know, and that's their way of connecting, collaborating and learning and creating a network. It's kind of doing something about over sort of beyond your own practice almost. And it connects you, you know, it might be an online debate that Art Chat do, you know, um, which is on Twitter, because obviously that's where the more debate space <clears throat> can happen. Or, you know, sad grads set up by a new graduate and she's got some funding and she's interviewing really interesting curators and artists and, you know, because she's going, well, look, I've got an opportunity. Would you like to be part of it? And and really going for it rather than sort of saying, yeah, my graduation show just didn't happen this year. Um, and kind of making it really kind of helps, as I say, empower you. And we're running out of time. So uh, <laughs> we are running out of time. Uh, so just to say, alongside all of this opportunities, <laughs> is you really have to make time for marketing and promotion. You know, if you spend you know, days, hours on a project, you've really got to make sure that it's up on the website, that you've got, you know, again, physical things like business cards and postcards, even when things maybe are only online, it's great to get something in the post or be able to give something, somebody something, you know, making sure you're telling people, like the amount of artists that I've worked with, I'm like, please send me the, your news because <laughs> I've worked with you before. I'd quite like to know how you're getting on or I bought your work or somebody's, bought, you know, let keep in touch. And social media is a huge thing. And, you know, it's a great way that's been levelling the playing field, but also um, allowing you to kind of access people that you might not ordinarily be able to, but like actually utilising it and not just kind of passively using these things. Um, <clears throat> thinking about who's your online network, do you have one, what, who are they, who's following you, uh, are there interesting people, you know, and again, any relationship, you know, whether you're in a lecture like this, 
or an art talk or an exhibition, message people and say, that was a great exhibition. I really enjoyed that. You know, pub, you know, like promote it yourself. It will really bring yourself to other people's attention in a really good way. And thinking about that, um, you know, and who do you want to be in your network and start with approaching them, not in a sort of spammy way, but like, you know, you follow somebody, you send a message, you've got a connection, you know, you say, I love this work, make a comment and so on. Because we always need to keep building our networks, finding new people to work with, you know, uh, collaborate with and so on. So, you know, I'm sure you're all on social media, but I mean, I think as well, just sometimes people find it quite difficult to use it as a kind of professional tool or don't see the point. And it's actually amazing. It's like the, if you think of it as a, the, like the most powerful professional tool you have, it kind of changes the motivation a little bit. Like actually this will work, you know, there's evidence for everyone that it will work if you start to kind of build on it and spending time on it, not just kind of posting randoms and, you know, quality stuff and just you know making sure even just you know it sounds obvious again but I see people just throwing up an image with, you know that's not a great image or no great text no hashtags whatever it is um, but just thinking about that and then actively commenting and so on but you know there's loads more mm -hmm. uh, to say about this and many other subjects but it's about building that relationship being memorable you know come say hi say <laughs> hey tell us how it helped you uh, hopefully this talk um, there's loads of stuff on ArtQuest. I can't recommend them enough all the time. Uh, amazing resources uh, and funding. And this is really key. You know, there are so many people in, in the arts, you know, you've got to kind of to keep reminding people you exist. Remember to say thank you. That's being kind <laughs> and memorable. Um, so um, that brings us to a, a close uh, to our kind of session and to mm -hmm. say a little bit about our next online course, which you can sign up to. Um, and it's uh, seven seven sessions. The final one is a Q&A, but we're going to be talking even more about the kind of social media and sort of ideas about marketing, not just sort of on social media, but other ways. Uh, writing and talking about your work with articulating mm -hmm. your practice. This is like a huge kind of bugbear for artists we know. Um, so like loads of tips and like how to motivate you or think about writing mm -hmm. a statement. Creative Collaborations is a talk that I do about working with other artists, with other types of spaces, galleries, public galleries, private galleries, um, but just those kind of different kinds of collaborations that you can set up. Um, we have uh, Money Matters, which goes into... Um, Everything to do with money. <laughs> lots to do with money and how to deal with the lack of it. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, all sorts of things about different kinds of exhibition models, curating and a bit of an insight into, again, motivating, like we've shown you, you into maybe curating your own opportunity for other people, um, the portfolio careers, what you, how you might apply that, you know, um, your art practice across different fields, as we kind of touched on here. Mm -hmm. And the final opportunity, which is kind of also about maybe you want to set up an artist-led initiative, but also things around funding, um, and sort of creative thinking about how to create the fine art of opportunity. Um, and the final session is kind of Q&A, but interactive. And it's um, along the way, kind of you're also, you know, building a network of the other people that are on the course. Mm -hmm. It's really valuable. It's really <laughs> affordable in terms of all you're getting. You're getting a, a lot of hours of insight. Uh, I think as yeah. well as that, for us doing this last year, I mean, we would have had our site set on doing a residential course with Claire Hill, but actually it was just a really nice sense of community and, you know, every couple of weeks coming together and this kind of um, sense of uh, an ongoing conversation, which was just really great for us too, because it, it kind of yeah. um, just makes you rethink things and think about things afresh and like, mm, yeah, could I be doing this differently or, you know, so it was, it was kind of really nice in terms of um, community, which I mm. think, you know, we've all been missing quite and also it's um i mean it is built around our careers of which you've seen a tiny glimpse of um as well as you know the experiences of many many other artists that we've worked with or know or are, you know and it's so there will be more about you know there will be stuff about our work in there to give you context because otherwise it's just a really random general very standard not very insightful kind of um talk where you just feel like yeah but how and how did you do go from here to there which is really like i've been to many art talks where i feel like i like what but 
but I haven't learned. How do you do a consignment? How do you write a proposal or whatever it may be? So there's kind of practical things. There's kind of templates you'll get. You know, you'll be able to rewatch the um, sessions sort of a week after um, or f- well, for the whole course, you'll be able to rewatch whilst the course is ongoing. So if you miss session one, you can go and see it a couple of weeks later. Um, you can drop in to different things and then if it's not convenient time wise. And then there's like resources that we send you. So we're like crazy, stupid, um, <laughs> generous course, uh, but brilliant as well. And, you know, so much stuff we want to share to make your journeys of thriving and surviving as an artist a little bit easier than perhaps some of our experiences have been. Um, And it's fun as well. Um, It's, uh, we have a laugh. So hopefully, you know, if there's loads more info on the website of Clayhill, but um, we'll stop screen share for a few uh, quick questions. Mm.